Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage. This is day three of Media Week here in New York City. This is theCUBE's new East Coast studio here on the show floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Behind me you can see all the action down on the floor. This is where Wall Street and Silicon Valley collide. That's theCUBE bringing the New York a stock exchange wired network community together with the Cube and Silicon Angles to create kind of an open concept of sharing content. Our goal is to get that data and share it out with you. And here with me, Noam Schwartz, who's the founder and CEO of Active Fence. Uh, he's out of Brooklyn in New York. Congratulations for the startup and well, Thank thanks for coming much. on the Cube. Uh, sure, thank you for having me. <laughs> well, we love, we love the entrepreneurial action, certainly around cyber um, and defense and also security in general, what you guys are doing. Let's get into it. Talk about, set the table for us, give context. What does Active Fence do? When was it started? Where, you, where are you guys in your journey? Cool. So Active Fence was founded in 2018 and with the promise of how can we make the internet safer for us, for our children, for our communities. And it started, Slowly, <laughs> with helping social networks fight count, uh, terrorism, hate speech, disinformation, for really understanding what are the cause of that type of uh, content and how can we leverage AI to fight it and scale. And then we realized there's something really meaningful here. Uh, we raised about $100 million. The company grew up to about 250 people, uh, tens of millions of dollars of revenue. And today, Active Fence is helping the leading gaming platforms, dating apps, social networks, obviously, streaming apps, but pretty much everybody with user-generated content, we're helping them with a content firewall, make sure that their users are safe and they can grow securely. So content firewall, love that word. Uh, is that an actual product? Is that more of a metaphor to what you guys are doing? It's, uh, it's a metaphor, but this is exactly how it works. Uh, our customers deploy their, their content through us. We sift through the noise, make sure that everything that is good, that is helping them, that is making a good experience for their users is passing yeah. through. And everything that is illegal, uh, like child porn, like tourist content, like yeah. extreme hate speech is being is staying out and yeah. not disrupting yeah. the, the experience. Uh, so obviously we're going to get into the Gen AI opportunities and the scale. Yeah. Let's talk about the market first because I think you brought up a good point around the content. Obviously we're in the content because we love media. Well, first we don't have that problem yet in terms of uh, the content moderation because our tribe is very, I won't say narrow, but it's pretty big, it's tech. You have comments? Um, yeah, we have, well we, well, we turned off comments. We turned it back on YouTube, but YouTube's safe. But. Um, you know, this is where when you start getting active communities, you mentioned content generation. I think what Gen AI was seeing a lot more content creators, a lot more vanilla content, uh, frictionless ability to con pro program. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to open up misinformation, deep fakes, a lot of things are happening around that. Um, how does a company figure this out? Because I think the problem is going to be what's real. Yeah. And then, so that's one. And then two, you have, um, bifurcation of audiences and tribes, and some, in some tribes, words might seem okay, and in another tribe, they're offensive. So these are kind of rule-based systems. Um, these seems to be the kind of the macro. What's your reaction to that, and how do you look at that? I'm sure you have solutions to, to yeah. address that. So you just described the uh, complexity of the problem, and generative AI didn't create the problem, it just made it way harder. So, so take a, a step back. You mentioned two things. How do we know that something is real? if it's fake or not. And how do we know if something is, let's say, appropriate uh, based on the context? Because something that is completely fine for us can be totally not fine for someone else and vice versa. Yeah. So those two issues um, are not new. Since the beginning of the internet, uh, fraud, fake stuff, <laughs> yeah. It's there all the time. Yeah. Uh, Criminal behavior has exactly. is, uh, is, uh, is been since the uh, d dawn of man. Exactly. <laughs> Society. So, yeah, so, so online fraud has been here yeah. since, the, since the beginning of the internet. We just discussed like Am the early days of yeah. Amazon. That was the same, they had the same problem back then. So now the problem is uh, harder because more people can use generative AI tools in order to create more believable uh, fake content. So eventually, generative AI technology democratized the access to, uh, to harmful content mm -hmm. and created more harmful content, but it, didn't, it did not invent the problem. Yeah. So you need to be more on the watch out, and you actually see yeah. that in the last 18 months. There's almost like 200% increase. So you're seeing a surge. Yeah, it's not in surge, it's more about our customers' reports when they deal with, when, uh, especially for insurance and e-commerce, way more activity 
yeah. they still find it because it's not that good. Technology is not there, yeah. but there's way more attempts. I've heard stories too of advertisers saying, I won't give you credit for my ad if it's on, on bad spe hate speech pages or inappropriate content. Yeah. So there's an advertising customer problem if you're a platform too, right? That, that's a good example why everybody care about harmful content. Like ad tech, they care about it because the advertisers yeah. don't want to uh, have their ad on a really nasty uh, article. Yeah. And also you don't want a very yeah. nasty ad to be on your <laughs> very nice uh, on your very nice content. So you need to understand exactly what's what is being shown. You need to you yeah. need to be uh, to perform in real time. I think I think accurate. I think this is a really important uh, moment in our history. Uh, this one issue that you're working on. So I think one great mission. Thank you. Love what you're doing. I think this is has to be figured out. Both of these contexts and inputs. So I'm sure Jenna will get there. We'll get there in a second. But I want you to tell me though what what was the origination story? Well, how did you get here? What did you say? Hey, you know, I want to I want to dedicate myself for for solving this big problem. Did you see it early? What was the motivation to uh, start the uh, active fence? Faith. Uh, but. Um, the, the true story is that's that's my second company. I already had a uh, had a company like uh, like a few years ago uh, that I ended up selling to a company that went public here. So uh, familiar with the with the place. And during the time that I was in like working there, uh, my first my first daughter was born, and uh, she was born also not very far from here in the Atlanta right. Hill Hospital, and she was born um, in ultra preemie like week twenty six. She's fine. God bless, but I spent two months in the hospital uh, with her. And during that time, uh, I started and I started getting a lot of uh, emotional uh, reactions to things that I was more, um, let's say, stronger for. And, and I saw things that are really wrong with our society and yeah. with our world. And I saw uh, content online that is abusing children. I saw content online that is trying yeah. to, uh, to break communities. I decided this is something that I want to do. And after a few months, uh, the opportunity presented itself. Uh, one of our today customers had a massive issue. Uh, they, they needed to fight uh, really bad content online. I thought, hey, there's, I know how to, how to solve it in a better way. And we created this algorithm that was able to find uh, malicious content uh, of violent extremists in a way, uh, better performance that they could. Mm -hmm. It worked, uh, and that became active yeah. fans. Uh, obviously, it's it's a massive story, and I'm surrounded by hundreds of people that are as mission oriented yeah. uh, as me. And this is why yeah. we get yeah. up every day yeah. because we we get a chance to keep the world safe. I appreciate that, and I think you know, sometimes stepping out of our day to day work yeah. and grind. I mean, being a startup, sold the company. Okay, you had glory. Um, it's always a great accomplishment, exits, but then having a um, family and having that moment to reflect, sounds like that was really kind of gave you ability to look at things differently yeah. and then find that cause. Exactly. And now you have the fire in your belly. Yeah. And how many years into it are you now? Uh, so Five oh, years? Yeah, seven years now. Yeah. Um, and t talking about that fire in the belly, one of like the biggest struggles of this uh, particular industry is that everybody has an opinion on it. Yeah. This information, just saying the word, yeah. is uh, everybody. Politically motivated or charging, polarizing. Exactly. I mean, exactly. yeah, and this is this is a problem with our society. There's not a lot of context and, yeah. and, and good discourse. Exactly, so you need to be very motivated yeah. to uh, make sure that you're, you're constantly fighting the good fight you're making yeah. sure that you're, you're, on, you're on the right track with your customers, yeah. you're keeping the First yeah. Amendment, and you make sure that everybody eventually gets to where we need to be, which is a good experience yeah. online. Yeah, and you know, no, and this is really speaks to what, why we're here um, with theCUBE and SiliconANGLE. Our yeah. mission is to provide great content as fast as possible from great people on point, whether it's as in the news cycle, authentic, original content so yeah. people can get information and then collaborate around it. Now we see a future where technology and tools will allow us to one, fight the good fight and make sure bad stuff doesn't come in, yeah. but then how do you get good stuff in? 
exactly. faster. So one of our missions, uh, shared values that you have is, you know, misinformation can only be countered with information that's relevant. Right. So how do you surface that and not let misinformation fester and fossilize in the narratives of, of society? So the only way to beat that is either defend it or kill it. Oh, and wow. go go at and get it and beat it and say, yeah. hey, that news that's being discussed or that content is not right. And that's going to require community and algorithms right. and data. So, you know, that's our mission. Yeah, and, you know, we appreciate you sharing. All right, let's get into some of the examples you've done and give us a, a use case. Folks that want to work with you um, and engage, you have a certain profile, customers at large content moderation sites. Is it enterprises? Are you looking at all kinds of uh, target use cases and market? Who's your customer? So we have two types of customers. Yep. Like you. In one side, there are, there are companies with a lot of user-generated content. Either you have chat with billions of, uh, of messages every day, mm -hmm. there is social network or a social feature where people upload an image, a video, mm -hmm. stream, speak into, comment, doesn't matter. You can't handle that manually, or you don't want to handle that manually. Yeah. So you deploy ActiveFence, you define what is your policy. We help you also uh, figure that out if you need. And immediately you get a score for every piece of mm -hmm. content and you can make a decision automatically based on that score. Uh, we give you the tools for looking into everything that is going on, the analytics, and know that you're safe, you're secure, you get feedback, yeah. it's consistent, the, the yeah. quality is high and eventually churn is going down, growth is like high, everybody's happy. And that's like the first type of customer. Uh, we also help them understand what is the most positive content that they have. So what you mentioned, we also help them elevate the good, not just stop the bad. Yeah. So if, you, if we find out- So you do that too, that's yeah, good. Yeah, so if you find the content that is actually positive and creating a lot of engagement, we help them make sure that that gets more visibility, that gets like yeah. more engagement, so they can actually create better experience, not just by yeah. pushing out the bad. A second type of customer, and this relates to the generative AI space. Generative AI uh, came and made pretty much every enterprise a content creator. Everyone who wants to create something with generative AI needs to think about how this tool is going to be used by the public. And it's also created another surface because you're exposed yeah. to the way your customers interacting with your model. So you can basically today, the way to hack a model is just like we're speaking to it or typing something into yeah. it. It's called prompt hacking. Yeah. And the model itself is speaking with your customers <laughs> and God knows what yeah. it's going to say. Uh, it's called um, it's called like content governance. So we do that so as well. So you got content today. poisoning, prompt injections. Exactly. And then, manipulating the data itself. Yeah, exactly. Those seem to be the vectors exactly. of, so, of, of pain. Yeah, so we work with the foundation models, like Cohere is a, yeah. is a good example and a yeah. very public one. It works with us to make sure there's no, uh, their model can't be weaponized and can't be used for uh, for creating child abuse and things around that. that so you're with Cohere on that? Yeah, exactly. Is that a business relationship or is that partnership? No, they're, they're our customers, Customer. okay. but they're, but they're our partners because yeah. we, we have a very close relationship with them. We love them yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and we work very closely. <laughs> and yeah, Aiden's success. a cool guy. He's been on the cube before, ah, cool. so he's a uh, good, good, good guest. Early on, I think it was two years ago when I interviewed. Now they're doing great. No, they're, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're doing great like, since day one. Well, so you then bring that to your customer base. So they're a customer of yours. You're partnering with Cohere. You're creating a safety model for them. Yeah, that's a safe model. That's like it's not the word. They're a model, but like you create a safe environment have, with their data. Yeah, and we you bring so, that in. So we help them make sure that their that their product is being used in a safe way. We have several ways to do that. Mm -hmm. We're doing it from either running our model after the model is being produced, from running our models before the content reaching the model, that's the prompt, the prompt hacking. We make sure that there's no data poisoning, as, as you yeah. mentioned, uh, and we also do red teaming. We, nice. we go after the model, yeah. uh, get the permission to do it, and we make sure that yeah. nobody can break it. Yeah, I think, I think you're onto something really categorically new, and I think I want to ask you because, um, you know, when, these, when you have these big changes in, in technology industry, there's not a person that's in charge. Yeah. It's a new persona emerges in these areas. I and mean, I can see, 
you know, the content moderating personal, I guess I got a problem, I need to solve it. I can see, uh, I don't see a CMO, well, it's not my department. I can see risk management being a, an, an opportunity. Yeah. Who, where does this land? I mean, because AI safety is a huge category. Guardrails is, is you know, I, I, I like the word guardrails. Sometimes it can be overused and to put the, the collar on things. But I think at the end of the day, you got to let things run and let it bounce around the guardrails. Uh, who, who's doing it? Like who's in charge? Like, who's, who makes the call, writes the check? I mean, it has to land somewhere and, and someone to drive, because you have to have cultural change yeah. in these organizations. Someone's got to say, oh yeah, just don't put the fire out. Let's structurally make process change. And you see that in security. You see that in application security in, in that world. Where does this land? Because this is a hot topic. Yeah, so th this is one of the questions that I spend Mo a lot of time on because there's no there's not a single person that is doing it there's no chief AI officer sometimes you have the CIO sometimes you have the CISO sometimes you have the ML ops AI ops DevOps yeah. it depends on the specific culture of the company uh, and if that company already implemented some sort of machine learning in the past so yeah. if that company is mature it will be the department that is dealing with that we see a lot of uh, companies actually sending that to the CISO uh, because they perceive it as a cyber security problem. I don't think it's a cyber security problem. Uh, you have observability issues, right? I mean, it's surface area technically, like yeah. everything else. So but it's, it's not it's, necessarily it's, a CISO issue, but the guys that can solve the problem are in the CISO area. They are machine learning guys, right? Yes. So this is where you come in. Well, but y yes and no, because yeah. let's say that you want to deploy a new, a new, yeah. a new AI yeah. uh, use case in your organization. Uh, first, it's under the CISO because the app is exposed and you don't want the app to get um, to get uh, PII. So, the, so it's the same DLP solution that will, you will use. But there's now like a new type of attack uh, that was not being uh, protected by any cyber yeah. vendor out there. Uh, prompt hacking, that's yeah. a concept, that is, that's a new concept. Yeah, it's a brand new opportunity. Yeah, and the governance of whatever the, the model is going to produce this is eventually trust and safety. So yeah. this is why Active Fence is so well positioned to take this market because this is what we've been doing in the past eight years. Yeah. We're the only battle tested and scalable solution yeah. that is right now in production, running hundreds of billions of calls every day. Yeah. And we actually know yeah. how to do that with the contextual issues that you mentioned. You know, it's interesting. You know, first of all, congratulations on one, your mission too, the success you're having. Mm -hmm but the opportunity that's in front of you right now is pretty significant. We had on yesterday the CEO and founder of Glean, former Googler, Rubrik, big time, he's, he's done multiple exits, kind of like you. Um, they were doing enterprise search, yeah. all right? But then he saw the models, because he's in that search world, so everyone knew what OpenAI was doing in 2016, 17, 18. So he, he was making the bet on this, and then, but it, he didn't have escape velocity and growth until the Gen AI became a thing two years ago. So, you have a similar opportunity where you've been doing, you're in the right area, and then all of a sudden, boom, you have escape velocity potential yeah. uh, for growth because everybody wants to move from what might seem niche in content moderation or limited TAM or TAM totalist market to everyone needs trusted, trusted AI safety. Um, you got private AI categorically as a new area in the enterprise. Private AI is on every enterprise's plate. Well, one, two, they want to have a private version of their data because now, Protecting data yeah. is, a, is categorically relevant because you fit there too. It's not just content moderation, you're protecting data as well. Exactly. So you're in the data protection business. Yeah. <laughs> so we found I'm a, that's a category. I mean, I mean, hey, Rubrik was doing data protection, then they became cyber resilience and went public. Yeah. So you have just, just put new suits on and say, hey, we're a trusted AI, and we do content moderation too. Yeah, so we're, we're staying loyal yeah. to, our, to our market, yeah. which I believe uh, is massive. And I think we already escaped velocity with yeah. that market yeah. uh, alone, because think about every online product that has some sort of a way to communicate, yeah has a trust and safety solution. And we really disrupted this market yeah. and we're right now the largest. I don't mean to that dismiss market. content moderation, but in terms of like platforms, yeah, there's the big whales that have machine learning expertise on tagging and all classification, I get that. But I, I, I do agree with you, I think it's a broader opportunity because every brand will have a dialogue bi-directional yeah. connection with the audience. Exactly. I mean, everyone will be in the media business exactly. because of the way this world is going. So that's a data exchange. Yeah. And that's an opportunity for exploitation. Yeah. 
I, mean, I agree with you. So I'm saying the TAM is big, but then, but now that brings up trust is over the top. Yeah. So I think this is why I'm trying to connect the dots here, but uh, you know, you're in a good spot. Yeah. Trust, safety, uh, security, privacy, all of them. Uh, now, what's your business plan? Give us an update on what you're, how you're going to tackle this market. How are you going to use Gen AI? What's on the mission plan for you guys? So we're using Gen AI, obviously, yeah. internally uh, to make our models yeah. uh, cheaper, faster, more, uh, let's say, uh, specific yeah. For, uh, yeah. for, different, for different type of customers. Uh, but the big thing here is that all of a sudden we encounter a massive market pool from type of customers that we never met before. Yeah. And we're now adjusting to cater to, cater to their needs. Uh, we're seeing a lot of success in that. So most of our growth this year came from the use cases of generative AI. And in my opinion, we did not see anything yet. Uh, I saw a cool slide by Cool2 a, uh, yeah. a few months ago showing the stages of the market development, talking about that now we're, we're in the yeah. phase of LLMs, uh, creating the models, then we'll put them on the edge. Uh, it will be on our mobile phones, like what Apple uh, announced like a few weeks ago. And only then we'll see those millions of apps yeah. that everybody's talking about that are going to be in production actually going to be deployed yeah. in the wild. Because yeah. now, if you ask uh, yeah. a random uh, company, how many use cases for Gen AI do you have, uh, do you have planned? They said like hundreds. How many you have in production? Uh, well, Two. Yeah, maybe. One. Yeah. And, and do you send, do you send like traffic there? Nah, not really. Why yeah. not? Privacy, safety, yeah. security, all of the above. Yeah. And so we're not there yet, and we're still seeing tremendous growth. I think it's on the table. Everyone's looking at it. They're kicking the tires. They're doing their due diligence yeah. on, on those guardrails. I think that's important because there's data involved. Yeah. Now, the thing about Gen AI and the consumer side, everyone loves the magic of the, of the yeah. user experience, but there's back-end processes that have to be looked at. Is the data owned by them, or is it talking to a third party? Is it intellectual property? Yeah. <laughs> is it secret sauce? Yeah. Well, let's keep that contained. Yeah. Let's create a different model around that. So and it's very complicated there, but I love it because it's another application. I mean, I think Jensen Wong at NVIDIA last year was right when he said it's a new category because it's, it's generating. Yeah. It's not static or calling a database. It's generating new stuff kind of at runtime yeah. and that's causing resources to change under the covers. Yeah, and like for those who were here for the cloud computer revolution, yeah. You know that when pe people said, this is insane, this is amazing, yeah. and they were underestimating the size of the opportunity from every single perspective, yeah. from like the pricing, from the services. Who thought that AWS will end up with 250 different services on top yeah. of AWS? Yeah. They had nothing back then. Yeah. It was insanely expensive, prices eroding 99%, and they're still making a lot of money. Yeah, that's, that's so, a cash machine. And AI, to me at least, seems like something that will make the cloud computing revolution tiny. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just going to be, I mean, if you look at what cloud did, that was a back-end innovation. I'm not having to build a data center, if you're a founder, I don't have to buy gear, I can just throw it in the cloud and scale as I grow, and then if I got to repatriate because of whatever reason, I can do a little bit of that, but I'll still get all the benefits of the cloud. I think you're right, I think SaaS wasn't a front-end innovation, that just grew out of the mobile generation. I think you're right, and I've been saying this on theCUBE, and I want to get your reaction, because I think this is, I mean, I, in my well, career, I've never seen this, how are this dynamic, both the back end and the front end are under massive transformations. Yeah. Disruptively enabling new things, yeah. which is, as entrepreneurs, is opportunity, right? So, do you agree that the back end and the front end are going on? Because you got process change, and data models are changing, horizontal scalability of data, I mean, that's going to decimate the data warehouse business. Yeah. It, I mean, even Snowflake with the data lakes, that's just the beginning of how data is going to change and be governed and managed. What's your view on that? Do you agree with that and do you have any comments? I think you have like a very good perspective on that. Um, when the cloud computing uh, came by, and it came by slowly. Yeah. Okay, it started you know, in the early 2000s, but then it really like got, got massive in the, uh, around like 2010. But that was a revolution for, as you said, the back end, for the enterprise. The enterprise did things completely differently. It affected the front end, the consumers, maybe yeah. it's like, the, like a, the, the right term, but you know, the consumer didn't really care. Yeah, it's, it, it's easier, it's cheaper, it's yeah. faster. Yeah. But I don't know what those engineers are doing behind the scenes, whatever. Yeah. Get me my coffee faster. Yeah. Get me uh, yeah. my cap. Store nap. that file. Exactly. <laughs> SaaS, 
good revolution, but for the markets. Well, the customer doesn't care. Like maybe they pay less, but they don't know it's SaaS. But here with AI, everybody's life are going to be very different. Uh, from like personal assistant that are going to make our life incredible. Uh, from the way that it's going to help us study differently. My daughter, she's in the fourth grade. She's already using AI in a proper way, not like for cheating, but uh, she's yeah. using AI to make uh, her, her educational experience better. When she has like a problem with yeah. coding, she's using uh, Copilot. Yeah. This is affecting kids in a positive way right now. Yeah. And this is nothing. This is the beginning. Do, is the how, beginning. how you drive AI, I like to look at like a car. You're going to drive it around. you got to make it work for you. Yeah, well, it's we're a, driving AI. Yeah, You've been in San yeah, Francisco yeah, lately. Yeah, you can order yeah, a self-driving car. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I live in Palo Alto, so okay. there it is. No, I mean, this is, a, this is, the, this is the benefit. So yeah. you're right. The user expectations are changing. Yeah. That will drive experiences yeah. that are going to get delivered, and that's still going to grow. The back end, you can't just get a new tech stack without a dropping process. So again, you talk about whether it's cyber or IT, you know, IT would say, oh, we got the new stack up and running, and the new technology, great, but you didn't change in the process. Yeah, like, can you imagine <laughs> your life now without ChatGPT? Yeah. You can or you can't? No, I cannot. I, oh, exactly. I, I use it all the time. It helps me get stories out faster, um, helps me understand uh, concepts faster. I move on to higher productivity. And I think personalization, I'm starting to see m myself use it to make personal benefits to me. So yeah. I, I think we're erring, um, entering an era of hyper-personalization. And again, the good is there, but you, are targeting the bad. So again, on every, there's symmetry to everything in life, right? Yeah. So for the good, there's the bad. Yeah, we, we're, ta we're targeting the, we're targeting the, we the well-being of the consumer, yeah. of the user and, and society and the companies themselves. No, it's great to meet you and thank you for coming into our, our kind of our kickoff, soft launch, <laughs> well, this is our third time here. We'll be back full time soon um, here at the NYSE with theCUBE and doing a lot more in New York and uh, you're in the network. Final question uh, or final question and a comment. What's the New York tech scene like these days? Uh, and put a plug in for Active Fence. If you're looking for people to join the mission, give them an update, give the plug. So New York tech scene, yeah. what's it like? And then give the plug. I think the New York tech scene has never been more vibrant. There's like incredible people, incredible talent. Uh, companies are starting to hire again. More and more companies are moving here. Uh, we, had, we didn't have our fair share of B2B SaaS companies here. Uh, from all kinds of reasons, but all of a sudden I see an, an incredible increase. So yeah. that's that's awesome. And we're hiring across the board, uh, R&D, yeah. product, sales, marketing, BD. No. And you guys are all over the world, You main, yeah. mainly in New York, but you're hiring remote too? Yeah, we're hiring remote. We have, uh, we have a, our HQ is here is in Tel Aviv. We have like places in Europe, yeah. in Asia. Awesome. Reach out. All right, check out Active Fence, their mission-driven organization, working on some of the hardest problems as this inflection point continues. Uh, there's real impact opportunity right now to change the world. Of course, we're doing our part here in theCUBE as we come to New York and start unpacking all the issues, talking to the best people and creating the open network with theCUBE and NYSE Wired community. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.